Hi, my name is Riona and I want to tell you who I am. I'm 26 years old and I'm engaged to James. I'm also a self-employed musician and private music teacher. For a couple of years, I worked as a secondary school music teacher, something I wanted to do since I was a child. However, over the last few years, I've had various health complications that actually forced me to stop doing this. I suffer with two conditions, chronic cluster headaches and chronic migraines, which have a huge impact on my daily life. Becoming self-employed has on one hand given me the freedom to work when I want, and I'm doing what I love as a job. But it also means when I struggle with my health now, I won't get paid for when I'm so poorly that I can't work. This is obviously very stressful when I'm struggling with my health. I'm questioning my ability to perform and teach my passion. Am I a person who used to be good but just doesn't have what it takes anymore? Is that who I am? If my identity is based on how well I perform, I'm always going to struggle and live with doubts and fears. But my real identity is not built on that. Let me tell you who I am. I am a child of God, loved, redeemed and accepted by Him. I am made by Him, created in His image and am God's masterpiece. That's not me bigging it up. It's me accepting what God says about me. And I'm going to go with that. That's who I am. Who am I? Now, that's a tough question to answer, isn't it? Now, I mean, often we try to find our identity in what we do, where we live, what we own or who we're with. But for those things, those things just add pressure to our doubts of whether we're good enough, likeable enough, wealthy enough. But maybe we are looking for answers in the wrong place. Hey, welcome to our series called Identity. My name is Steve and it is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, The Forge Online. I am so pleased that you're joining with us today. Thank you. Now, this week, two of my grown up children pointed me in the direction of a very helpful website that fits so well with this series. It's called buzzfeed.com. It's so enlightening that it helps you to discover who you are. I mean, you answer some random questions and it gives you insight into the big questions of life and identity. Questions like, what kind of cheese are you, feta or Swiss? Are you a nerd, jock, goth or prep? Are you a morning bird or a night owl? And which US office character are you based on your food choices? Now. I have done hours of research on this site in preparation for this talk and I've discovered who I am. I am Swiss cheese. Why? Well, as you'll see, it's holy. <laughs> a, a, a morning bird nerd who's just like Pam Beasley. <laughs> there we go. Honestly, try it. Uh, you will never get that time back again, ever. But there are countless ways to discover who you are. I mean, take a look at these five shapes. A square, triangle, rectangle, circle and squiggle. Now I want you to look at them and to decide which one you are most drawn towards. Go on, do it now. Okay, your choice has indicated something about your personality type, about who you are. So here goes. If you chose the square, you're most likely to be a very orderly person. You like to dot the I's and cross the T's. You're, you're on time and you struggle with others who are late. And if you chose the triangle, well, it's possibly that you're a born leader who might well end up running your own business or heading up companies. You're all about succeeding and are possibly less empathetic towards others. If you chose the circle, that's the right one. That was my one. It indicates that you're a people person, more interested in relationships than anything else. You're, you're a peacemaker, a relationship builder, a networker. And if you chose rectangle, it's likely that you're in a kind of a transitional phase in your life or you're slightly unsure of yourself. And if you chose the squiggle, oh dear. No, actually, not at all. It's likely, uh, you're likely to be creative, fun-loving, a bit of an anarchist. You're a multitasker, starting loads of things, but not always seeing them through to completion. 
So go on, did that work for you? Did that sum you up? It did for me and for others that I've shown this to. But if you want to discover more about who you are, there are numerous tools to help discover your personality type from Myers-Briggs to the Enneagram, Belbin and, and Strength Finder. And as a leader, these have really helped so much in my leadership style because it's different from many of my contemporaries and it's easy to feel intimidated and not a proper leader when others lead differently. So Bridget McIntyre, my coach, has been great at helping me know who I am and my style of leadership and then feeling secure in that. But you know, the question around our identity, who am I, is such a big and scary question and how we answer that really can hold the key to how we live, um, our relationships and where we put our energy in life. You see, it's not what we do that determines who we are. It's who we are that determines what we do. But it's so confusing because our identity comes in so many forms and it's locked up in so many different contexts. I mean, we're often asked for a means of ID, aren't we? Usually it's a passport or a driver's license. I've got my passport here. So who am I? Well, my passport tells me that I'm British. I mean, I'm a Suffolk boy brought up on a Suffolk farm. My roots are here. But how rooted am I? Because my dad was actually born in New Zealand. I mean, being British has shifted and changed from being white Anglo-Saxon to being diverse in both culture and ethnicity. I mean, do you remember the controversy recently in the news over the questions asked of Nguazi Fellaini uh, by Lady Susan Hussey a few months ago um, at Buckingham Palace? You see, Nguazi was born in England and lived here all her life. So she's actually more British than my dad, isn't she? So who am I? Well, my passport tells me that I'm a fenning. And if you see my brother, my dad, my son, my cousins, you'll see a fenning likeness. You know, it's in the genes. You know, my good looks had to come from somewhere. Now, the Fenning family has a strong farming background where we used to own several farms in Suffolk. At one point, Fennings would marry into other farming families and we slowly started to take over the county of Suffolk. Now, most of those farms have been sold now, so I thought I'd take over the county with churches, but to be honest, that hasn't worked out either. But who we are, is often strongly linked to our family background. It gives context and a sense of connection and roots, which is why programmes such as Who Do You Think You Are prove so popular on the BBC, where celebrities trace their family history. People like Kate Winslet, um, Olivia Coleman, and Sir Ian McKellen. And one of the standout programmes was uh, Danny Dyer, who said that he thought that he'd be related to a few criminals and discovered that he was actually a descendant of King Edward III. Honestly, the shock on his face and the emotions it raised, it was just brilliant TV. But you know, going back to our roots is important and that's what we're going to be looking at over the month of March. We're going to explore the question of who I am from a different perspective, a, a hard to take in perspective, but a truly liberating one. You see, when we base our identity on the wrong things, we, we go through life with the stress of trying to prove ourselves, a, a pressure to perform, a, a guilt feeling of not being good enough or a pride that's just horrible to encounter. I remember playing golf with someone a few years ago and as we played our round, he showed his golf clubs that were much better than mine. He told me about his car, which was really fast and expensive. You know, his guitar was worth much more than mine and his hobbies, all of which he was great at. Now, I don't think he consciously did this but he was so trying to impress, to, to prove himself, and yet behind it all, he was desperately insecure. You know, people can go through life trying to prove themselves, feeling that they're not good enough or that they're a failure, and they're never secure in who they are. And even, even our teaching in church about living for Jesus can come across sometimes as you've got to do this and you've got to stop doing that, as if our faith and our identity is dependent on our performance. And it's not. 
Which is why answering the question correctly around our identity and who we are is so key in experiencing peace and contentment, purpose and freedom. Experiencing life as Jesus wants us to. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, the thief comes only in order to steal, kill and destroy. In other words, the devil wants us to doubt who we are, to steal us of our dignity and destroy our confidence in who God has made us to be. But he goes on, but I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. So let's go back to our roots, to what God has to say about us. And the Bible starts with some amazing news. That in a, or as our world was coming into being, the writer describes the development in the form of days. And it comes to day six and he writes these words. He says, God said, now we will make humans and they will be like us. We'll let them rule the fish, the birds and all other living creatures. And so God created humans to be like himself. He made men and women. Now, you and I have been created by God. We're no accident. We have a creator, a designer who places huge value on us, who loves us, who delights in us. And David, who wrote many of the songs that we find in the Bible, said this, you are the one who put me together in my mother's body and I praise you because, uh, because of the wonderful way you created me. Everything you do is marvellous. Of this I have no doubt. Nothing about me is hidden from you. I was secretly woven together out of human sight, but with, my, uh, with your own eyes you saw my body being formed. Even before I was born, you had written in your book everything about me. And then to back this up again, Paul, one of the writers of the New Testament, many of the letters there, he wrote these words which I just love. He says, for we are God's masterpiece and he's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Listen, you are not insignificant, a mistake, a disappointment. You're not a loser. You are created, loved, shaped by a creator God who places huge value on you. You are made in the image of God himself. And as God loves, so you can love. As God thinks, so you can think. As God is relational, so you desire and build relationships. As God is able to create, so you can design and build and produce amazing things. And as God is able to say enough, you have the power to do the same. We are God's masterpiece created with a purpose in mind. Now, do you hear that? Do you sense the dignity and value that God places on your life? This is who we are. Our identity is found in who our maker says we are. That is so powerful. At the very core of our identity is God, the one who made us in his image and who loves us. And we are loved because of who we are, not what we've done. You know, our identity is not based on us, but it's based on who God says we are. But remove God and who are we? Well, at best, we're an accident. We're here on this planet by chance, a fluke, and, and with no purpose other than what our instincts tell us or what we kind of invent for ourselves. But if it's true that we're made by God and that our identity is found in Him and not on, uh, on what we own or, or who we know or what we do, well, then why do we struggle with self-doubt, that feeling of not being good enough, of insecurity and at times shame? Well, I said the Bible starts with good news and it does. And then it goes on to describe a pivotal event that caused a disconnect, a fracture, a kind of a brokenness to our identity and our relationship with God. It's known as the fall where sin entered our world and destroyed the intimacy and confidence that humans had in God and our relationship with him. Sin, disobedience created a barrier between ourselves and God and our identity was fractured. You know, we could do good, but we could also do evil. We could build trust relationships and we could also betray and hurt and damage others. We could create the most amazing buildings and equipment and machinery to benefit others. And we could create gas chambers and nuclear bombs. Guilt, 
and shame entered the world as a consequence of sin and it stayed with us ever since. Which is why Jesus is so important. You see, God came to earth in the person of his son Jesus to begin the work of putting back together what is broken, restoring what is fractured and reconciling us to God again. That Christ died to take our guilt and our shame on himself by dying in our place so that we can be free to live with a new confidence, not based on ourselves, but on what Jesus has done for us. This is how Paul writes about this to some new Christ followers in a city called Corinth. He says this, Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. So we let go of how we used to view ourselves, are either full of pride or guilt, of self-seeking or believing that we could do life well without God. He goes on, he died for everyone so that those who receive this new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. And then he goes on to say this. So we stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. Uh, at one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. And here comes this is what he says. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone and the new life has begun. So Jesus came to restore our broken identity. When we come to accept Jesus and what he's done, we become a new person. And it's not based on how well we've done or what we own or what we have achieved. All of that is in a sense rubbish. And Paul goes on, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to himself. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. So God is wanting us to have a new identity, one that goes beyond being made just in his image. It's an identity based on what Jesus has done. And so much of the New Testament and the Gospels and the letters focus on who we are based on what Jesus has done for us. I mean, have a listen to the identity God gives us as a gift. This is who we are. We are a new creation with a new nature. We are in Christ and Christ lives in us. Uh, Mike's going to pick up and explore that next week. We, we're adopted into God's family, we're chosen by him, and Becky in two weeks' time will be exploring this on Mothering Sunday. And that we are forgiven, made clean, restored. And Pete Collison's going to pick up on this at the end of the month. You know, we are made in God's image. We're made by God. We are God's masterpiece. We're children of light. We're citizens of heaven. We're loved. We're redeemed. We're restored. We're renewed. We're not who our friends or our enemies say that we are. We are who God says that we are. That's our identity. And when we accept this and when we believe this, it brings security and peace and purpose and hope and life and confidence and courage and security. Why? Because it's not based on me. It's not based on my performance in life. It's based on what Jesus has done for me. So I want to ask you over this next month to stick with us and to discover your true identity in Jesus. And in the meantime, I want to encourage you to read one of Paul's letters, uh, Ephesians, or, or go to the Right Now Media app and watch the online Ephesus study uh, and see how Paul starts with what Jesus has done and who we are in him. And then he goes on to, and this is how you should do life in the light of this. Paul never calls us to do something or live in a certain way without first reminding us of Jesus and of our identity in him. Because that's the foundation on which we should build our lives. I tell you, this is going to be a great month. So please do stick with us. Hey, let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much that who we are doesn't, and our identity doesn't just rest on how good we are, how well we perform, how much we earn, what job that we have. Thank you that our identity goes much deeper than that, and that it goes beyond us to actually who you say that we are. 
And I wanna pray over this month that you would open our eyes to see who you have made us to be and so that we can own that and live our lives with a confidence, knowing that we're loved by you, made by you, saved by you, forgiven by you, reconciled by you. Lord, help us to live in the confidence of those truths. In Jesus' name, amen.
circumstance.